Welcome to this series on the solid design principles. Wait, the S-O-L-I-D, the solid design principles of object-oriented programming. So S for single responsibility principle, O for open closed principle, L for list of substitution principle, I for interface segregation principle, and D, what does D stand for? Ah, dependency inversion principle, silly of me. But today we are going to talk about the L here. L as in Liskov's substitution principle. And if you've ever read about it before, you're like, well, just reading the name Liskov's substitution principle, it's kind of like an instant brain explosion. You're like, who chose the word substitution? Like, substitution principle? Like, what does even a principle of substitution mean? But actually, if, if, you, if you dig down and you try to start to understand Liskov's substitution principle and you calmly try to just read it and think about it, it's actually very simple and like once you get it you're like but isn't this blatantly obvious which it kind of is right but the thing about Liskov substitution principle which I find particularly interesting is that it's one of these things in programming that are very very well defined like there is what well, we'll read it in just a moment there is a logical definition of what, what strictly what it means for something to follow the Liskov substitution principle. Now still, there's a lot of room for interpretation and semantics, a lot of room, and we'll, we'll get into that. But still, at least there is a rigid definition, which for many things there are not, right? Like single responsibility principle, for example, right? Like what does even doing a single thing mean? Like that, that's super up for interpretation very, very much up for, inter for interpretation. And even though there is interpretation or room for interpretation in Liskov substitution principle, there's less room for interpretation. So let me just write the name here. What we're talking about is Liskov's substitution, substitution principle. This is what we're talking about. Liskov substitution principle. Uh, and clearly the, the, the person who invented the Liskov substitution principle was named Liskov. Let's read the definition from Wikipedia. So prepare yourself for another mind blow. Substitutability is a principle in object-oriented programming. Stating that in a computer program, if S is a subtype of T, then objects of type T may be replaced with objects of type S. In other words, an object of type T may be substituted with any object of subtype S hence the name substitution, by the way, without altering any of the desirable properties of T. <laughs> Correctness, task performed, etc. <laughs> right? This is like, okay, so I have to know logic in order to know this because I have to know, like, use this strange notation of like S's and T's and types and whatnot. Stick with me, it's actually pretty simple, we'll talk about it. And then there's this other sentence that says, more formally, the Lisk of substitution principle is a particular definition of a subtyping relation called strong behavioral subtyping that was initially introduced by, ah, here it comes, Barbara Liskov, Liskov, hence Liskov substitution principle, in 1987, ah, actually in a, in a conference keynote address titled Data Abstraction and Hierarchy, that was given, this, and this keynote was given in 1987. Actually, I was born in 97, booyah. Okay, anyway, here's the really interesting part. You know, I said it does allow for some wiggle room or some room for interpretation. Here, here's that interpretation part. It says, this is, or it is, a semantic rather than merely syntactic relation because it intends to guarantee semantic interoperability of types in a hierarchy. And then actually, here's, here's the principle in the way they formulated it in, in a paper that Liskov and then somebody called Jeanette Wing published. And this definition is actually not that strange, so let's start in that end. It's a bit like logic heavy, so you have to put your like scientist hat on and go, okay, I shall now read logic and I shall not be intimidated by it, but let's go. Let me remove this stuff. So here's the quote from the paper. It says, here's the subtype requirement. Requirement. Subtype requirement. So they're saying, what if there is some property provable of some, some x? Let this made up hypothetical pretend property, let this property of x, so let this thing of x be a property, be a property provable about objects x of type 
t. Then, let me just type this out and then we'll talk about it. Then, this property of y should be true, be true for objects y of type s, where s is a subtype. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I know, brain explosion, sorry. Where s is a subtype of t. Booyah. <laughs> Terrible, right? But uh, actually, it's completely logical. I know this sounds like total gibberish, but it actually makes complete sense. Let's do this. Let's, let's, let's first think about it this way. So, what do we got? We've got this important thing. Or actually, let's do this thing. We've got x's. Let me put these in red. We've got x here. We've got x here. And we... Yeah, that's it, right? We don't have any more x's. No? Then let's take green. And then let's just say we have y's, right? We have y here. We have y here, and yeah, that's it. And then what? Then we have t. Ah, I'm running out of colors. This is a bad idea. Let me do it. Let me do it this way. Y, x and y are variables, right? So, so let me say those are red. Right? So y here and y here. Then we have types. So let me put those in in green. So there's the type t here, and then there's the type s here and here, s and s, and actually s here as well, s. And then there's T here, T, and that's it, right? Yeah. And then let's take blue and make this property blue. So there's this property also, property here, and this property here, and that's it, right? Yeah, so those are all the sort of magic words, right? Those are all the keywords. So, so let's, let's, let's now read this and let's think about it. So here's the thing, what, what they're saying is that there is this hypothetical, arbitrary property something something, right? Let's, like, let's call it circle. I don't know, this symbol probably has a name, but who cares? There's, there's this symbol. An object can have this property. So an X, which is any object, right? It's, it's an animal instance in your object-oriented system. It's, it's a, an instance of a user class. It's an instance of a resource manager. It's an instance of a factory. It's an instance of whatever you have in your system, right? So, so X is something. And the thing is that when we say it's an instance of something, right? That something is of a type. So if it's, if it's a user, for example, then the user is the type. So user is the class. And then we have an instance. And what we're talking about here when we say X, we say we're talking about probably collections because it's plural somewhere when we say objects. But in order to simplify, let's just think about it as, as a single thing. So this X represents an instance of something of a type. And in order to talk about all types at the same time, we are talking about T's. This is why we have these, these, these two green things. We're talking about T's and we're talking about S's, right? T's could be the same as S's, could be, but it could also be different. So T is one type, could be animal, and S is another type, could be user, or it could be any other class, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's general. And then X's are something of uh, some kind of type. It, it's some kind of instance. And the same goes for, for Y. Y is also a variable that represents an instance of some kind of class. And then what we're saying is that this blue thing, the, 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 the circle, says that an object can have a property. And this might be, let's think about it this way, it could be like responding to the method speak, I guess is what kind of what they mean here. So if X is an instance of an animal, so its type is animal, and animals have a method which is speak, then this property could be this, this speak method. So, the only thing that this, this whole mess is saying, right, is that if there is an X, and X has this circle property, so if you think about uh, classically object-oriented, if you think, think about classes, right, so, so T is a class, T defines a method, and that means that all instances, if they are instances of T, then that means they have this method, right, That's, this is all we're saying. So X's are T's and they have this property. But they're saying that if that's the case, then it should be the case that all y's, so another instance of another class, they should also have this property, should be true, right? For objects of y, if these y's are of type s, where type s is a subtype y. I just realized I'm an idiot. I wrote the same sentence two times. <laughs> so here it says, where s is a subtype, where s is a subtype of t. So I'm sorry, let's, let's just remove this stuff. Where s is a subtype of t. <laughs> That's what I meant. Sorry about that. T even like 
typing it from the text it makes me super confused. Anyways, so we're saying that y's should too have this property if y's are of type s and s is a subtype of t. Let's draw this in UML. Think, let's think about it this way. So you have, you have two classes where one class inherits from the other class. So you have the type t and then you have the type s. Should have used green again to emphasize that these are the types. But you have t up here and then you have type s. And so type S is a subtype of type T. It is a T. And the only thing we're saying here is that if there is something that T's do, right? There's, there's something, there's some method that, that T responds to. There's, there's something that T's can do. Then necessarily, S's must be able to do that. Subtypes must be able to do that same thing. If not, I mean, why are we then saying that S is a T? And that's the whole point, right? So this is what they're digging down into. They're, they're trying to show us when we should not use inheritance and when we should use inheritance. So if you've got a cat, which is an animal, and animals speak, then cats necessarily speak, right? But if you have, ah, actually this is a very good example, because if you think about it, not all animals speak. Right? So if we're modeling the whole world, most of the time we're not, which is why we, we don't have to think about those scenarios. But if we are modeling like a tons and tons of animals, let's think about an animal that doesn't speak. I mean, snails maybe don't speak, but they're still an animal. So that means that we would be breaking this of substitution principle because we're saying that a snail inherits, a snail inherits from an animal and animals speak, but snails don't speak. That makes no sense. We can't say a snail is this thing, and to be of this thing, you need to have this property. But suddenly this thing that we just created, the snail doesn't have this property. It makes no sense. And that's what they're trying to stop us from doing. So that gives you an excellent way of thinking about inheritance. You have a type, and then you have subtypes of that type. You have some kind of concept, and then you are saying that things can be of this concept. There is the notion of being some particular thing. And some of these things are uh, this thing, right? You have, you have this hierarchy of, of, of being, right? Like you could have animal and then mammals and then uh, some subtype of mammals. I'm sorry, biology is not necessarily my strong side, but you know, you, you realize this, this whole chain, right? And when you're traversing down this chain, it's super important that whenever you state that something up here in the chain has some kind of property, something up here does something, then everything downwards has to submit to that property or has to, has to adhere to, has to respect the, the existence of, of that thing, has to, uh, so, so back to their, their statement, has to be, if, if, if this O is a property provable by objects or about objects of X, then everything down the chain, everything down the inheritance chain, it needs to be provable for all of those as well, right? Because otherwise you can't say it is of that type. And this is really the key notion. And this is, I mean, think about it. This is why we talk about composition over inheritance, because most of the time we are really looking for composition because we're making two general statements. We're saying that, oh, all of the animals can speak, but actually all of the animals cannot. And, and the really dangerous part is we think that we have identified all of the subtypes of animals that we will see in our system. And then we get new requirements and then we realize, ah, oh, okay, actually we missed a few. And then suddenly we may end up in a situation where we're breaking the of substitution principle if we're not refactoring. And this is why we're talking about composition over inheritance. Compose things. Use the notion of has a rather than is a. Because has a is much less uh, troublesome, right? Of course, and when you say has a, and that thing that you have has its own inheritance, uh, has its own inheritance chain or in inheritance hierarchy, then of course you, you still have the Liskov substitution principle applied to, to that inheritance hierarchy. But that's because that's an inheritance hierarchy, right? Just a has a relationship doesn't have this problem. But yeah, so, so in summary, the really simple way to think about this is that you have two types and the parent type, if you state that something is true about the parent type, it has to be true all the way down the chain. If you state that the parent type can do something, all subtypes need to be able to do that too. There's a lot more depth to the Liskov substitution principle. This is just part one. In the next video, we will talk about contravariance and covariance.
<laughs> I know, like the strange words just keep on piling up. <laughs> contravariance and covariance. And then in the next video, we will talk about design by contract, right? There, there's, there's some, and, and this is really where we get into the sort of semantics of Liskov substitution principle. So, so we will talk about things that you might have heard before, preconditions, postconditions, and invariance. So preconditions are things that have to be true when executing a method, for example, right? Like upon entering a method, what has to be true before that method is applicable? Post conditions are what needs to be true as we exit the method. And invariants are things that always have to be true, like for, within a class, for example. Like during the lifetime of, this, uh, of an instance of this class, this invariant rule, this, 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 something that's stated as an invariant can never be broken. And these help a lot when thinking about what Liskov substitution principle actually means in depth. Like when we say this whole thing, like let, let O be a property of X, that blah, 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 blah. Like this, this whole thing. That's fine and dandy, but there's a lot more nuance to it. And this is what we're going to talk about in these two videos. Possibly I'll do it in the other order because I think this makes a lot more sense and I have to read up a bit on the contravariance and covariance. Maybe even the same video. We'll see. Sorry for splitting this video into two. I ran out of time. I hope this first portion made sense. I hope you now feel that Liskov substitution principle is a little bit less intimidating. Thank you super much for watching. Remember to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.